Hi, this is Lisa, and you are listening to I Love That Movie. This podcast is for movie lovers. It's not an unbiased opinion. It's not a straightforward review. It's just a couple people talking about a movie that they love. The format is each week I have a guest, and that guest and I discuss a movie that they love, something they're obsessed with, something they connect with. We'll talk about the plot, the director, and the actors, but we'll also talk about the personal connection my guest has with that movie. So if that sounds like something you want to listen to, keep listening. This is Lisa, and you can find me at ILTM Podcast. I'm also on Instagram at I Love That Movie Podcast, and we have a Patreon. The show is always free, but if you want to join us on there, you can. That's at patreon.com slash I Love That Movie. And if you uh, sign up, you do get a weekly bonus episode of just my weekly roundup that I've been watching, obviously, right now, watching uh, the book of Boba Fett, among other things. So, Uh, We have a lot of fun on there, and I'd like to take a moment to thank my top patrons, and they are Chris Belga, Jeff Widman, Philip Barker, and Michael Cross. Thank you guys so much for keeping the lights on. And if you like what you hear today, please subscribe and rate the show. It does help new listeners find us. Well, I've got a familiar voice on the podcast. I've got Jared from the Nerd Knighted Nations podcast. Say hi, Jared. Hey, thanks for having me back, Lisa. Hey, yeah, welcome back. You know, you've been on uh, uh, once or twice, right? Yeah, at least a couple times. I get confused because I've been on your show a couple times, too. Well, I've been on the show proper one other time to talk Gremlins. And then oh, that's I'm right. That's your, right. Uh, I'm your Bill Burr guy when it comes to That's the right. Movie. Okay. I knew I'd, we talked more than once. Okay, that was on the Patreon. Uh, but we're not talking about the Patreon today. Um, and Jared, if people haven't heard you on the show before, did you want to introduce yourself just a little bit? Um, uh, my name's Jared. I'm the co-host of uh, the Nerd Editions podcast. We're just a podcast where my co-host Melissa and I and a guest talk about anything nerdy from comic books to movies to TV to whatever trips our trigger. Um, that's really about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad that you're back and my guest always picks the movie. What movie did you choose to talk about today? I picked the movie I've been bugging you for a year and a half or so about uh, <laughs> the 1999's Mystery Men. Yes, good choice. Good, good choice. I'm so excited to talk about this. So uh, before we dive in, I do want to let listeners know we will be talking spoilers. So I would suggest seeing this first and then coming back to the show. Um, but if you're still here, this movie came out in 1999 and this is the uh, the synopsis of the film. So Champion City already has a superhero, the appropriately named Captain Amazing, but that doesn't deter the city's seven quirky amateur crime fighters who use the captain's capture at the hands of the villain Casanova Frankenstein as motivation to prove themselves. The only problem is that their strange powers like silverware, hurling, bowling, shovel skills, uh, flatulence, and invisibility aren't doing them any favors. When did you first see this movie? I saw it in theaters back in 99. I think um, I did too, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, to tell a quick story, if that's okay. Oh, go for it, go um, for it. The town I live in now was where I saw it when I was a kid. Um, my hometown only had a small, like, three cinema theater at the time. So my father took me and my brother down to where I live now, is multiplex, to see it in theater. So That's cool. Yeah, I think I saw it with my dad and... I walked out of there really liking the film and having no idea that it like that it was going to bomb and, you know, that other people didn't like it. I loved it. So I just think it's interesting how it's become kind of a little bit of a cult classic. Oh, definitely. This is also speaking of love. It's also the first movie I ever owned on DVD also. Oh, really? Oh, that's that's I was thinking about that question the other day. I saw somebody on on uh, Twitter say like what was the first DVD you ever had and I I can't even remember so good memory on you yeah well I'd never forget it to my pop it in I just think but like you I had no idea that it was gonna bomb uh, even when you read the uh, 
like IMDb facts behind the film. Like, it's not like it's such a miserable time for everybody involved with it that it seemed like no TLC went into it. I know. I had I, sh- I struggled. Like, you know, I have a couple quick facts that I want to share, but I wanted to make sure that they were positive. There were, like you said, a lot of negative facts about the cast kind of you know, getting into arguments on set, people not uh, agreeing on what the tone of the movie should be, and then ultimately sort of wanting to walk away frustrated. I remember back in the day after seeing it, seeing an interview with like Janine Garofalo, this wasn't in the notes, but I just remember it about her complaining about the film. And, you know, in the, uh, on IMDb, you can see facts about Ben Stiller complaining about, I mean, people just like wanted to wash their hands of it. Which is so weird because I just enjoyed it so Even much. Even the director wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah. Um, but we'll go back to some positive facts. So here's a couple of things that I wrote down uh, about the movie. Um, a number of the sets that are in this film are the same ones from Batman Forever from 1995. It makes sense. I mean, you could kind of tell there's like a campy vibe to it, you know, and it is a comic book film. So kind of makes sense. Uh, the Mystery Men were the supporting cast of an underground superhero comic called The Flaming Carrot. Uh, Mr. Furious and the Shoveler were actually the only ones from the comic to make it into the movie. Captain Amazing was created as a replacement for The Flaming Carrot, who was felt to be a little too bizarre to bring to the silver screen. I bet they could try it now. Yeah, I feel like people would be a lot more receptive to this idea in general now. You know, when we watch stuff like... I don't know, like The Boys or Suicide Squad or Doom Patrol. I I think about this movie a little bit. And the way I was trying to think of it when I was rewatching it the other day is um, this movie kind of fell in the cracks between Batman and Robin and Blade where a lot of like like this and Spawn kind of just fell in the cracks because people were a little sick of comic book movies because of how Mm -hmm. bad Batman and Robin was. Then Blade and Spider-Man kind of revamped everything. But the way I looked at myself, I think this kind of laid the groundwork for the Suicide Squad and Guardians of the Galaxy in a way. Yeah, I you agree. Get this, you get this group of ragtag heroes that come together and try to fight this ultimate evil. And it's such a good cast. Like, I can't get over how great the cast is. Um, I'd read that Ben Stiller even considered directing it. But then when he realized how big of a project it would be, he kind of backed out of it. And uh, Janine Garofalo ought to talk him back into doing the film in general from what oh, I heard. Oh, really? Yeah. Gosh, I, I, I love her. I, I, I don't think this was my first experience with her. I think Romy and Michelle was probably the first time that I saw her. But I, I loved her in this movie um, along with Ben Stiller, William H. Macy. Who doesn't love William H. Macy? Uh, Hank Azaria as the Blue Raja. Um, Kel Mitchell, I forgot he was in this. Um, and Paul Rubens as the Spleen. I think... I think the spleen walked so that Polka Dot Man could run. I would I would take that too. I remember being a huge Pee Wee Herman fan. Me too. Being so excited that he was in this when I saw him in it. Yeah. It's also got Jeffrey Rush um, and Eddie Izzard which, and Tom Waits. I mean, just a pretty big cast. Oh, that, wait till you get to the cameos and you talk about big names. Oh, yeah. Michael very ba- true. Michael Bay, CeeLo Green. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dane Cook, Doug. Oh Jones. yeah, Dane Cook. Yeah, Doug Jones. Oh, I didn't. Who? When was Doug Jones? I feel like I missed him. Uh, he is pencil head. Oh, that's right. Okay. And you have uh, Dana Gold is another one of the superheroes that shows up to that tryout. Wow. And then you have and you have Artie Lang at the beginning, who's the leader of the Red Eyes. Man, that is a lot of cameos. Yeah. Well, um, did you want to talk a little bit about some of your favorite scenes from the movie? Uh, yeah, one of the ones that uh, comes off the top of my head is uh, Casanova Frankenstein's uh, um, hearing when he's still in the insane asylum. And I think this is the first film that probably caught my – that put Jeffrey Rush on my radar. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah, because cause if you read Wikipedia, it says this was his first Hollywood film, which I have a hard time believing. Are you serious? In- Really? Yeah. <gasps> he was in Shine that. not that long before that, though. Mm. I don't know if his work was strictly Australian or not before this. but Oh, gotcha. This, this was a film that put him on my radar. I think the same for Greg Kinnear, too. Is that or... I love Jeffrey Rush's speech when he's at his hearing. Yes. And if, and if I ever had to give a monologue for a play audition ever again, that would be one of the monologues I'd love to give. 
<laughs> That's and awesome. Like every time I watch that, it just like buries in my head. I think of that all the time. I want to think if I want to play a character that's like a little mentally unhinged i think of like casanova frankenstein because jeffrey rush is amazing in this film i i agree like he's been a man of many faces to me like i'll, I'll always know him as uh captain barbosa and as casanova frankenstein until the day i die that's great <laughs> and i love um like i said i love jeffrey rush in this film but i think Pretty much any scene with William H. Macy in it is amazing, too. Yeah, he's the best. I think he's the true MVP of this film Mm -hmm. because of how flat he plays it. Like, I love the debate they have in the diner about if uh, Cat's Amazing is Lance Hunt. The whole thing with glasses doesn't make any sense. He wouldn't be able to see. (laughs) He's such a good actor. You know, I love him in everything he's in. Um, But when I think about this time period of of him, I think about like this movie and like Magnolia, which came out the same year, which I really enjoyed him in that. He's in Boogie Nights, uh, Fargo, just so many good roles. Yeah. For forever. He was just known as the guy from Fargo until this came out. But now he'll always be the shoveler. I I (laughs) never watched, I never watched Shameless, but he will. I haven't watched Shameless either. (laughs) Um, I'm trying to think of some other see if you have one, go ahead. I can think of another one. I um, I think when I was younger, uh, I really got attached to the bowler. I like her whole thing with the her dad being in the bowling ball and uh, flying around, and I love the banter that she has with the whole crew. And I don't know, I just enjoy Janine Garofalo, so I just kind of like this is one of my favorite films of hers, and she's just got. This look, like I, th- I like her costume too. I like the costumes in this as well, um, in general. But I- any scene with her, I really like. This is probably my favorite role of hers too. I I think like you, I think she either came on my radar during her time on SNL or mm, Romeo yeah, and yeah. Michelle. Yeah, so I watched Romeo and Michelle a lot too. Yep, so good. And it just, I mean, it's just very nineties. You know what I mean? Like she just. It reminds me of that time so, so much. Um, also, I like the Blue Raja. Frank Azaria as the Blue Raja is pretty entertaining uh, with his forks. I like the scene with his mom. <laughs> or I guess there's more than one scene, but like when you first find out he's like not British, I like thought that was really funny. Oh, and he's practicing in his room. And yeah. <laughs> keeps, that's, that's a good scene. Well, I also like when they... Uh, when they first form and they go and they attack a Casanova's limousine in the yes in the alley or they basically just beat it up like they don't really have a plan of how they're going to get him out of there or what they're going to do next they just kind of go at his car and it's pretty funny he doesn't seem that phased by it like describe it as they're out to annoy him and I think Jeffrey Rush looks thoroughly annoyed in that in that scene True. so. When uh, Stiller's jumping around on top of the roof, just shaking the car, he's just sitting there rolling his eyes and (laughs) had enough of it. Yeah. I did like the exchange between Garofalo and Eddie Izzard, too. Um, We found out how uh, he's one that killed her father. Yeah. Long ago. I think they use that scene a lot, too, for the um, Smash Mouth All-Star video, too, is when they're in the limousine. That's right. You know what's weird is people remember that song as being from Shrek, but it was definitely in this one first. Oh, yeah. That's where I remember it from. Yeah. So I think they even have the Mr. Men in the video. If I'm they not do, mistaken, yeah. So. I think you're right. It's That's another great one. I do like uh, I do like the final battle, too, when they're storming the mansion, and you can see all the other gangs that are in Champion City, and Watching them pull all the stuff off, like using the shrinker on one of the on one of the gangs and using the blame thrower on the not so goody mob, I think they were called in the movie. Yeah. I like all the different like sets of people, like all the mobs, like you say, or like the mob and like the frat guys and like I like the concept of all that for all the different villains. I want to say I think it was um, the DC Film Squadcast is when I found out whenever they reviewed this last year 
that that was Michael Bay that's the leader of the frat boys group. Oh, really? That kind of makes sense. Yeah. I, <laughs> kind of fits. I've watched, this, I've watched this movie for years and never knew that was Michael Bay. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Learned something new every day. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, it was like a few years ago when I realized that CeeLo Green was uh, one of the rappers. But, um, but learning that it was Michael Bay was definitely mind-blowing. Yeah. Did you read that uh, Tom Waits had trouble with his lines and he like wrote them on his hands? Yeah, I did hear that. I did read that today, I think. And it said like uh, the director just left it in because he felt like it worked for the character. Yeah. He's a little unhinged and he's making all... I like the concept of him making those like weapons that don't kill anybody. <laughs> oh, it's great. Um, I, I've only seen Tom Waits in a couple films, but I loved everything I've seen him in because he's agreed such good uh, energy to it. Like, uh, I like how, I like how he, when he first meets the shelver. I'm at the old folks on the meet the ladies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that whole scene at the, the old, at the, uh, yeah, at the retirement home too, because it's like, I don't know. It's just funny. The idea of people like robbing them there and then they try to, the mystery men try to stop it, but they're like so inept at it and, Captain Amazing has to come in and save the day. Um, I think uh, that character is pretty funny, too, which it reminds me a lot of, like, you know, in, like, the boys, like, Homelander or something, just a person that's very arrogant and has kind of let it all go to his head. I also like the fact that in the future the superheroes have sponsors. Oh, yeah, like, all over all over his thing. I wonder what he did to lose Pepsi. Did they say? Well, I think what his publicist was telling him is that because he had no huge, like, supervillains, no arch rivals oh, okay. anymore. okay. They were just like, what have you done for me lately, that, kind of. Okay. Yeah, the big fights bring in big, or big names bring in big money, you know, and all he's fighting his little gangs here and there. Yeah, I, I hadn't seen this in so long that I was trying to remember. I couldn't remember if he turns out to be bad or he just dies. <laughs> Like, if he was going to have a turn where he's working with the bad guy. I literally couldn't remember the ending of it. But um, he, of course, gets hit by that ray instead. Yeah. Well, I know he offered up to Casanova Frankenstein to be his assistant if he let him go. Oh, yeah, that's true. He did. He, he buckled under pressure for sure. Yeah. Which, all the banter between Jeffrey Rush and Greg Kinnear in this film is pretty good, too. I Agreed. like uh, when, Captain, when Captain Amazing comes to take him in after he blew up the insane asylum and tells him to take off all these little gadgets and everything. Cause he knows them so well. And then he just falls for a stupid little, uh, what was it? A uh, chloroform, uh, snare. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, it, but what always stuck with me with that scene was the way Jeffrey Rush was, this is an amusing little gizmo. It's really quite cool. <laughs> <laughs> I did love that. And, uh, I love. I I would just love to live in Casanova Frankenstein's mansion. That thing looks so awesome. Yeah, it's pretty nice. You got your own great parties. Got your own disco room. Yeah. Yeah. That that scene of Eddie Izzard in the disco room always stuck with me too for the longest time. So most, yeah. Because every time I hear that Bee Gees song, I think of Eddie Izzard doing that dance. <laughs> <laughs> I like that gang. Yeah. They can't the resist boys. like. Yeah, they can't resist like. <laughs> breaking out into dance before they do anything which like later it gives like the shoveler time to attack them uh furious and them are critiquing them before they beat them up like hey if you're gonna have a chain at least have it be a gold chain yeah that was what william h macy calls the one guy the disco plumber because he's got a lead pipe <laughs> disco plumber that's a comic book rating to be written yep have you ever read the comic yeah. that this is kind of based on? Uh, I've never read any Flaming Carrot. Me neither. Um, I think they might have done a. I think they might have done a few issues of Mystery Men also prior when this came out. I do remember looking it up in high school, but just never getting around to it. Yeah, I haven't read it either. I'd be interested to though. And now that we're adults, we got a little expendable income. I have to look into it now. There you go. Did you uh, read that? Uh, who else was originally supposed to direct this film? No. Uh, Danny DeVito was allegedly attached at one point. Oh, really? 
To direct? Yeah. Interesting. To direct and star as the shoveler. I guess I could see that if they went a different direction with the shoveler. And and I could see that too because I think he, he I bet he could do it now because I think Devito tends to have a little bit of a darker, like a darker humor to his stuff. Yeah, true. So I could def I could definitely see it, but I think now I think he's too far associated with uh, Frank Reynolds on It's Always Sunny. Yeah. But I think a nine I think a late nineties Devito could have pulled off the shelver, but I just I just see William H. Macy in that role. And I think it's one of the things that keeps me coming back to that film because I I gotta love his uh egg salad speech that he gives oh, yeah. to get the team fired up. <laughs> back when we thought eggs were I feel like eggs are always, you know, back and forth. They're good for us, they're bad for us, they're I guess around this time they were bad for us again. I think so, because I remember you grew up in the 90s like I did. We got those commercials, I love eggs, from a head down to my legs, commercials, all that stuff. So. <laughs> yeah. This is the kind of information I keep in my brain all the time. Yeah, I get it. I loved egg salad sandwiches when I was a kid, but now I feel like that's such like an old thing to, to even make anymore. Yeah, yeah just, you don't know, want to take the risk of uh, going to a store and buying store-bought. I want to play roulette there. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Might wind up like the egg salad sandwich from Futurama. <laughs> but he didn't end up having um, to eat it because they went and saved the world. So, yeah. said, "What the fork? Let's do it." I forgot that the Blue Raja kills Captain Amazing by accident. <laughs> so I loved that yeah, too. I, and I remember being a remember being a kid and just loving that back and forth they have with them, all just pointing fingers at him, and he's just trying to, well, whoever's to blame, whatever. I love how that becomes like a running joke through the last half of the movie. Is like they tell him don't touch any toggles, or I love how the shelver goes. What do you mean we? I was standing over here. Yeah, he like immediately gives him up. He's like, I was over here, and it's just ironic because Blue Roger was the one that was like most smitten by him too. Like just most, you know, his biggest fan almost. And he's the one that kills him. <laughs> Great, I love the whole. That's like the one time you see uh, Furious and the bowler working together, too, because usually they're at each other's throats back and forth, but he actually stands up for her when uh, Amazing Calls her a moron. Yes. It's, it's a, I think there's too many great scenes in this film to name off. He essentially lists off the whole movie as being great scenes, like, Except for maybe one, the skunk scene probably is like the only scene that doesn't really work for me in the whole film. Yeah, that part, that was the part that I imagine Ben Stiller cringing at <laughs> when he yeah. didn't like certain things in the film. Um, yeah. And then what's mis- what's his name? Mysterious or Mysterio? What's what's his uh, The Sphinx? The Sphinx. I'm sorry. Yeah, the Sphinx. Um, I like, uh, when I was younger, I remember constantly quoting when he says like, to go left you must first go right when he like busts that he just is saying like the opposite of everything to make it sound like sage advice i like that scene too if you don't learn to master your rage your rage will become your master is that what you're about to say not necessarily (laughs) (laughs) the sinks was great too and i love how nobody knows about him all they know about him is that he's terribly mysterious terribly mysterious that's a power (laughs) being terribly (laughs) mysterious yeah and i like the scene where they upgrade all their costumes too and they're sitting there sewing them uh ben stiller's all frustrated with going on anybody i have any i need a thimble anybody have a thimble (laughs) but what what were your thoughts on uh kel mitchell being the invisible boy did you think we're actually going to see him invisible back no in that i remember that surprised me but being happy for him that he really is invisible when no one's looking at him and yeah, it came in handy I, I, one time yeah and that he can't even if he looks at himself he becomes visible yeah they're like mm. oh we i mean we kind of touch on it too but i also like the tryout scene as well that's good do you remember, I do love the the two Wonder Women fighting with each other. Yeah. Loving that. Uh, the ballerina man I thought was hilarious. I think that guy came back as one of the disco boys too later on in the film. <laughs> I like too I the, like the, the, the swimming pool and like the fact that there's like AstroTurf all around it. I don't know. I just, I like the aesthetic of uh, the shoveler's house a little bit. 
Yeah, I like the whole aspect of his family too. I like a little yeah. how he just takes everything from his wife too. Like when they're getting ready to have the tryout, and she says, "If one woman said so one person vomits in my pool, I'm divorcing you." And he goes, "That's fair." <laughs> she's supportive, but she's kind of at the end of a rope at the same time. Understandably. Yeah. When you get the classic line, I shovel well. I shovel very well. <laughs> I think oh, another funny part to me, too, with involving the shovelers when he's in that fight and the like the shovel gets knocked out of his hand and he's got the little tiny shovel. That made me laugh. Oh, the, the, the trowel. Yeah. yeah. I did like that. That was a good one because he learned from the Sphinx that he has to use more than just his use more than one weapon. Was it what does the Sphinx say? Like his fists Leash and out. stuff, too. Yeah, you leash out with every limb like an octopus playing the drums, I think the Sphinx says. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you think, would you go for a gritty reboot if they did this now? Uh, I, 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 I would watch it. I kind of like a reboot just, you know, along the same vein, like lean into the humor even more. I would be fine with too. I would definitely like to see more. I could go for that. Oh, go for it. Sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I just, I, I'd definitely go for it too. I think it's, I think what it just came out in that dead space of comic book films. Now who would have known like 20 odd years later that we'd be getting multiple comic book films a year. Yeah. It would be a good time to bring it back. I think it's developed enough of a, of a cult following, like you said, and maybe at least in our age group. I think a lot of people are fond for it, and are those of us that are like in our mid to late thirties now that saw this in the theater when we were teenagers, and I think we got enough nostalgia. They, plus, nostalgia is huge right now with like Ghostbusters and uh, everything else that they're bringing back now. Yeah, I agree. I be, you got two things that are hitting hard right there with nostalgia and comic books. I think would I think it's almost due. I'd like to see the original cast come back too, because I think they're all still alive. So. Yeah, I, I was going to say what's what's challenging is I really like the cast a lot. So it would be hard to see different people as them. Like, I would accept it, but they're just so good in these roles. Like, yeah, if they do bring it back, it would be kind of nice for them to bring it back that way. Like a continuation or something. Or they could be raising like the next generation of mystery men or something. I'd definitely go for that. And... This is the for Nintendo. This was a pretty stacked film for like 1999 cast wise. Mm hmm. So it's it's nowadays, like everyone from the 90s is like in it. <laughs> yeah, for, like nowadays, it would. The, I think the budget alone would be through the roof just to pay for those kind of names. But like, yeah, it doesn't oh, yeah. get much more 90s and like Ben Stiller, Janine Garofalo, Hank Azaria, Kel Mitchell. Because so I always joke that this is like the last thing I remember seeing Kel Mitchell in. He kinda, for real, like, he kind of he really did. I was thinking about that watching movie that that was unfortunate. Because I liked him in this, I loved him in all that, in uh, Keenan and Kel when I did watch it. So, wonder why Keenan hung around longer than uh, Kel did. I don't know. I mean, Keenan is really talented. He's been on SNL for yeah. like a hundred years, or he was. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And Eddie Izzard always that that's always like I kind of forget that he's in this. It's because he's so young. I think like in my memory, he's older than this. Until but after, probably yeah. yeah. They had to now like after this film came out, I'll go. I know him. That's that, that's that's the that's Tony. I think he's Tony C or Tony P. I can't remember which one. Tony P. Oh, he's got Tony P. Yeah. yeah. So every time I saw Eddie Izzard in a preview or a commercial, I'm like, hey, that's the guy from uh, a Mystery Man. <laughs> I I even knew the girl that played Ben Stiller's girlfriend in this beforehand because I, I saw her in Mallrats before. Yeah, I yeah, I was just looking at her IMDb because um, I, I thought she looked really familiar and I couldn't place her. She's got like the uh, perfect apparently. 90s haircut too that like right at your jawline. That's like the hair we all wanted at that age. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, it looks like she's just almost playing the same character from All Rats. Pretty she much. divorced TS. She divorced TS, moved to Champion City, and started dating Mr. Furious. Yep. I think my cat agrees. 
every once in a while I hear the little jingle or hear a meow. It's so cute. <laughs> well, uh, we have a we have a saying and we have a a jokingly uh, Nerd United Nations bingo card for us. And one of the things you cross off for me is you hear a bell ring or a cat meow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, speaking of Kel, I was just looking at a picture from the where we kind of are introduced to him. I forgot that he's the invisible boy because his family doesn't acknowledge him. Like, nobody acknowledges him. Like, when he walks into his room, he's like, hey, Dad, I'm taking three strange men to my room. And he just, like, doesn't even look <laughs> up. It's like he's invisible because his whole family's ignoring him. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah, I, that's great. I, I love how he's got them all, like, on the edge of their seat talking about being invisible. Like, when you're invisible, you can feel it. And they almost feel kind of let down. Yeah, they're like, oh, this is not going to work. He does not have powers. And then we haven't really talked about the spleen yet and his powers. Another great monologue that I love is when he tells us how he got his powers. Oh, yeah, from the curse. Yeah, and... I'm pretty sure I drove a lot of friends and family nuts talking like the spleen for the back in the oh, 90s no. too. <laughs> <laughs> so cause I used to, I just love that about him. <laughs> I love Paul Rubens has done a lot to prove that he's more than just Pee Wee. And I love that he does all this other stuff. Yeah. He's so funny. I like his outfit too. And it's just funny the way he and the invisible boy pal around. There's kind of like little packs of people within like subsets and they're kind of like the two members that are like quote unquote not proven yet because we haven't really seen them do a whole lot but they come in handy at the right moments of the film and then the unofficial official first members but oh i think the bowler is like the first official first member to join because yeah they haven't we're not dishing out memberships left and right whatever uh mr furious said but I was happy, too, in the end that her dad, uh, or the bowling ball, makes it. Yeah, that was cool. I do remember seeing that in the theater, when that ball comes flying out and uh, fades to black. I remember some guy in the theater just yelling, boo, really loud. <laughs> he's like, no. Downtime when it was fade to black. <laughs> well, he comes back, so he's okay. Just a little charred. I want to say, <laughs> I want to say my uncle's bowling alley had one of those bowling balls, too. Oh, really? Cause I remember wanting one really bad too. I'm not a huge bowler, but I'd I'd want a Carmine the bowler bowling ball. It's pretty cool looking. Yeah. Even now, 20 years later, I'd still buy one of those. I wouldn't take it with me, but I'd just put it on a shelf somewhere. Yeah, display it. I was thinking watching it, these would be great costumes to bring to like a con. I've seen a couple shovelers in my time. I hope to see a bowler costume out of you sometime. Yeah, that would be really fun. I would really love to do that. I bet I bet Nick would be the shoveler. I'm sure he like that was probably his favorite character. As long as he gets like an egg salad sandwich prop. That would be really be funny. Perfect. I feel like that would be really easy to make. You could use like um like insulation foam and just like color it. <laughs> I hope he does this now. I want to see I'm, this. I'm gonna my tell him now. after I'm done. Yeah. I'm gonna tell him. I don't know who I'd cosplay as because none of them had beards, so I'd have to like. Oh no! Yeah, you I'd might put... have to shave. Oh no, never. No, no. <laughs> or you could be in one of the gangs. Yeah, I, I could be. Uh, I could be a Tony P. He had, to, he had a little bit of a goatee. I can there you go. braid it and tuck it up. I don't know if I'd look that good in the suit though. Like Eddie Izzard looks pretty sharp in that disco suit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you could pull it off. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, let's see. Are there any other scenes? Are we missing something big? I know it's kind of hard. Like you said, every I scene like is I, really good. It, it essentially, you just sit here and talk about the whole movie. Yeah. Really. Because the whole movie, except with the exception of this, with the scene with the skunk that's kind of weird, is, is so good. And it, it's... You look at it, it, it just seems like we, we talk about the behind the scenes of this film it seems like it's such like a frankenstein parts of a movie here but it all flows together pretty well like yeah all these yeah different segments yeah because ben stiller said he liked the original script more um and i guess they made some changes that he didn't really love but i i like the end product i mean i don't know what was changed but i thought it worked i, I really enjoyed it so i think i remember a lot of stuff between him and garofalo was 
improvised. Get to hold them going back and forth. And, that makes sense. Uh, did you hear the? Did you see the behind the scenes about that uh, when the Sphinx is talking to them when he first meets them? No. And that little fireball goes up behind the spleen. Uh, he just says, "Excuse me." That was actually somebody threw a lighter into a barrel behind him that caused that little fireball to go up and caught everybody off guard. Oh my gosh! Well, glad no one was hurt, but definitely uh, yeah, added something to that scene. Got their attention for sure. <laughs> And uh, right on for Paul Rubens, just going with the flow. Yeah. I mean, that's what happens when you get some good comedians on there. You know, they're good at improvising, for sure. Personally, anything with Jeffrey Rush and it, Casanova Frankenstein, it is uh, a favorite scene of mine. I think he belong. I think Jeffrey Rush's Casanova Frankenstein would belong in like in a like a list of like awesome comic book movie villains. Yeah, I agree. I think he does a great job in this one. He's he, he does a really good like balancing act of it being funny but still being like a very convincing villain too. It sounds like he knew his assignment coming into it. Mm -hmm. And he's chewing scenery, but he, his delivery is so spot on. Yes, it works. A good he comic book movie has to have a good villain and he's a good villain. Uh, and I wish I'd like to like if too bad they killed him off when they threw him in the fraculator. But um, if he would have survived, he would have been a villain I'd love to see come back. I don't, I don't think Jeffrey Rush has acted in a while. But uh, but he's like, because he's one of those actors I get excited every time I see him in the cast list. Yeah, he's getting well, up there. That might be why. Maybe he's retired. Yeah, I looked at IMDb just to verify if this was his first Hollywood film. And I, he hasn't done anything since 2019. So Wow. Yeah. But I guess we'll always have him as Barbosa and Castle and Frankenstein. There you go. Because I, I said on a, on a on our show that I defended the, the all five parts of the Caribbean films mostly because of Jeffrey Rush's performance as Barbosa. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot like a lot like in this film, when you get those later films of the Pirates franchise that. His Barbosa is essentially like his castle of Frankenstein. He he knows his assignment. No matter how out there the material he's given with given, he still comes and makes it look like he's the best character in the whole film. Yeah, he's a professional. I do love um the debate between Shoveler and Furious about who Cat's Amazing really is, and I love how Shelver's still so fixated on when they're trying to save uh, kept amazing that he just has to ask him in the middle of this whole debate, like, hey, uh, are you billionaire Lance Hunt? Oh, yeah. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, no, that would be so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what end up, ends up distracting him from uh, keeping track of how many times the bowler has flipped the toggles and everything. Yeah, I love that it has to be flipped a certain number of times. Seems very precarious. Uh, it's seven toggle flips he's that are in total are needed. Like, yeah. It seems like a lot. There's only like three or four toggles on the wall. I know. There. <laughs> but I think he's, I think they, I think Greg Kinnear did such a great job of just playing this, like you said, kind of like a arrogant hero that he's so full of, like, like he was so sure he could get out of that thing, but he, I don't think he really had a clue how to get out of that thing at all. Cause I don't think, no, and if he wasn't, like, think... yelling at everybody, he probably could have. I would have think that Casanova Frankenstein probably would have, like, told him how to get out of it. Confident that he knew that he wouldn't be able to get out of it. True. And plus, with it being such a... Uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, complex machine to build. That uh, it would... What's uh, Tom Waits' kicker say? That most people that tried to build it went to the mental institution or oh, yeah. a crazy house. And so what, what would make Captain think he could just simply get out of that? Catson Frankenstein's been in the mental institution for 20 years working on it. Right. Just arrogance, I guess. Which Kinnear played that very well. He did. Much like how William H. Macy will always be the shelter. Every time I see Greg Kinnear in anything, it's always Captain Amazing. 
Yeah, he, I, I, yeah, he does a really good job, and it, it does feel very like a lot of the stuff that we watch today, just a little ahead of its time. I think it's really like I think of favorite scenes. I think. So um, I guess that brings me to my last couple questions for you. So number one, if you had to summarize, why do you feel like you keep coming back to this film? Why is this such a cult classic for you? Uh, as much as I love, it has to be the performances from the cast. Yeah, I like, I've have to agree. Gone on and on about like Jeffrey Rush, William H Macy, Ben Stiller, Paul Rubens, Kel Mitchell. Like all of them are just so good in all their roles. Like, no, there's no small role that wasn't great. Any any small actor was great in this film. Yeah, I think the scenes are pretty solid. I think it's a solid film all the way through. Absolutely love the cast, like we keep talking about. And I just think it was a little, the whole film, a little ahead of its time. So I, I say, you know, go check it out if you haven't seen it yet. What what would your pitch be to someone that hasn't seen it? Well, I'd hate for it to come off like an insult to the director since he's passed on. But it'd almost be like, how would you like to see The Suicide Squad or Guardians of the Galaxy through the lens of like Joel Schumacher? I think that's pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah, and you say I, that lovingly because I mean you like the movie <laughs> yeah I do say that lovingly because I know Batman Forever and Batman Robin get their um, get their stones thrown at them you know um, yeah. for how they are I was in that party for a while too ever since Joel Schumacher passed I've kind of come around on him because he was just doing the movie he was told to make yeah I agree Which so at least, so at least you can say he he was told what he did to Cause I think he, it seems like he did more, not that it's a negative, but it seems like he did more for Batman Robin and Batman forever than this director did for this film. Cause it seemed like he didn't mm-hmm. care. Cause it's the only, it's the only film he's done. He went right back to commercials after this. Wow. That's sad when that happens, but you know, it's a lot directing movie. I'm sure is a lot of work. And when it's a bomb, that's yeah. gotta be discouraging. Yeah. It, it doesn't seem like a bomb. Cause I, it really seems like a lot of people talk about this film. And Agreed. It's hard I to think, believe that it bombed. Yeah. Yeah, I would say check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Um, I think there's a reason why it's got a cult following. I think, again, like, you know, even the cast, the director, the general public not really getting it back then. It's just, I think, it again, I keep saying it, but I think it was just a little ahead of its time. It, and it, It's one of those movies where if it's on, I stop and watch it. Yeah, uh, c- yeah. A c- couple years ago, I was getting ready to move out of my dad's house in my apartment. I'm moving boxes out to my car, and my dad's watching Mystery Men. I Aww. plop down and start watching him. I plop down and start watching him with him. That's awesome. That's good to have that memory with him too. Yeah. Well, Jared, this has been a really good discussion. I love this movie, so I'm glad that you picked it. I'm glad that we revisited it, and I appreciate every time that you come on. Um, where can people find you? Um, you can keep up with me on my podcast with my co-host Melissa, the Nerd Dive Nations podcast. Um, yes, great podcast. Of... Thank you. We we'll hope to have you on again sometime. Oh, for sure. Um, you can find us pretty much wherever you find your podcasts: um, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio. We're on all the social media at Nerd Dive Nations Podcast, and uh, you can keep up with me personally on. Facebook, no, not on Facebook. Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter at QCA Mr. J. Just pictures of my beard and of my cats. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on, and I hope to have you back soon. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs>